Now we're going to talk about a febrile infant who's eight weeks and older who appear well. The general tendency is uh, to consider eight weeks uh, up to 24 weeks as one group now, primarily because uh, at about eight weeks or so, there seems to be much more clinical information for uh, uh, physicians to go on. There's uh, much more eye contact, uh, interactions, smiling, playfulness, those are all important things. Um, their presence is reassuring and their absence is concerning, so you have a lot more clinical uh, indicators. There's also much less risk of uh, serious bacterial infection, and vaccinations have also made a huge impact and really sort of been the game changer in how we approach fever in this particular age group. With the 8 to 12 week old patient, I think still it's a subcategory that should be approached more cautiously. I think it's kind of tricky. Immunization history and milestones uh, are essential for you to uh, make a clinical assessment and not everybody meets them on time. Not everybody is immunized uh, by eight weeks. So I think uh, if you're in a community hospital setting, you probably want to be a little bit more conservative with the eight to 12 week old and possibly um, you know, stick with the same sort of an approach that you had for the uh, four to eight week old. So children who have a fever who are between the ages of eight to 12 weeks who otherwise appear well and are immunized and have a good follow-up can essentially be managed based on clinical criteria. But if they're not fully immunized or if there uh, is some other um, complicating factor, whether it's a social situation or other uh, issues, then the consensus seems to be to be much more conservative. Um, just remember, you're not just dealing with a numeric value of age. You also need to understand uh, the larger context of the patient in terms of uh, medical history, history of immunization, and the social support system. If, the, if this age, in this age group, if they're not immunized, um, then stick to your approach uh, of uh, four to eight week old, do a workup, um, you can use uh, your uh, clinical judgment in determining whether you need to do an LP because I think by this time you should have enough there to see if, if uh, an LP is required. And uh, once again, at the time of disposition, you're going to talk to the pediatrician who will care for the patient and, and arrange for a tight follow-up. Um, and generally, in my experience, these patients almost always get one dose of uh, uh, IM antibiotics. So that is really the subcategory in uh, eight weeks and above. Okay, now let's concern ourselves with uh, uh, eight weeks and above child with a fever who's fully immunized in a stable social situation. So what is a workup for uh, eight weeks to 24 month old um, infants with a temperature of 103 or above? Now clinically, if there is nothing on the physical exam, they are smiling, they're interactive, you basically the question you're going to need to answer is could there still be a serious bacterial infection uh, that's hiding an occult pneumonia a uti bacteremia now we're of course much less concerned about meningitis at this age group because you do have the ability to use a clinical judgment there are a lot more milestones that develop um, as long as a kid looks well smiling playful um, you don't have to worry about meningitis. So meningitis is not a cult in this particular age group. So let's look at some of the infections um, that we get concerned about, such as occult pneumonia uh, and uh, UTIs and bacteremia. And when do you start to get concerned about these, uh, these infections? Y your first clue may just be uh, the level of the temperature. I think generally when you start to reach 103, um, you start to get concerned that perhaps there's something else going on. So the higher the temperature is, the more sort of uh, uh, careful you should be in terms of trying to rule out an occult infection. In terms of occult pneumonia, there are lots and lots of studies that have looked at the use of chest x-rays in these particular patients. And what they have found is that there are clinical um, signs and symptoms that, that you can use to rule out a pneumonia without having to do a chest x-ray. If as long as on your physical exam you don't find uh, a significantly increase in the respiratory rate, uh, 
from the baseline for that particular age group as long as there's no grunting or strider nasal flaring um, you don't hear any uh, rowels on auscultation or wheezes um, and that you have a good pulse ox then 99 percent of the time that patient is going to have a negative chest x-ray occult UTIs uh, it is a higher risk in a certain subset of patients, uh, boys who are less than three months old, girls who are less than three months old as well, girls less than two years, uncircumcised boys who are less than one year, and circumcised boys who are less than six months. Now, occult UTIs occur in 10% of febrile girls and uh, uncircumcised boys younger than one year. And uh, in 5% of girls between 1 and 2 years who are febrile. So for, for girls, it's always a risk factor. For boys who are circumcised less than 6 months, it's a risk factor. For who, uh, boys who are uncircumcised who are um, less than a year old, it's a risk factor. Now, the uh, American Academy of Pediatric recommends a catheterized urine specimen for all febrile girls and uncircumcised boys younger than two years without an obvious alternative uh, cause for their fever. Occult bacteremia. Now, if you remember the 90s um, and, and, the, and the approach to fever in that time, um, generally uh, any infant over the age of three months who had a temperature of more than 1 or 2.5 and no source of infection on physical exam sort of got a standard workup, which was a CBC, a set of blood cultures, urine analysis, and a urine culture. Of course, the main fear was that there may be occult bacteremia. Um, and uh, this was a significant concern in the age of H flu and before strep pneumo vaccination became standard. The first game changer in terms of uh, bacteremia was uh, the vaccination for Haemophilus influenza type B which came out in 1988. H influenza uh, type B uh, disease has since decreased by 99% and it is almost non-existent at this point. Um, even those who haven't been uh, immunized um, have uh, the benefit of uh, herd immunity. So Haemophilus influenza type B is pretty close to eradication. When it was a big player, it used to account for 10 to 20% of um, bacteremias, and of those, 25 would pr progress to meningitis, and 40% would result in serious bacterial infections. So um, this, the, this vaccination has really eradicated H flu type B disease. Next um, big player in uh, bacteremia that uh, we worried about was uh, strep pneumo. Uh, it was uh, much more common than H flu, but it was a lot less virulent, and generally it progressed to meningitis um, in 2% of the cases of bacteremia. And the uh, vaccine for it, uh, for the PCV7, uh, the brand name Prevnar, uh, was introduced in year 2000. And a bunch of studies have looked at what happened to strep pneumobacteremia slash infections after uh, the era of vaccination. And this particular slide lists uh, a bunch of those studies for your reference. Now, for both H. flu and uh, Prevnar, the first vaccinations begin at the age of two months. And um, that the, these immunizations have totally changed um, the picture, as I, we just discussed for H. flu. In terms of uh, post-Prevnar era, there's a 95% decrease in invasive disease for the stereotypes covered by the vaccine. There's a 75% decrease in invasive disease for all serotypes. And overall, bacteremia rate is now less than 1%. Uh, there was a recent study that found no cases of pneumococcal bacteremia um, in immunized children uh, and only a 2.4% rate in unimmunized children, which generally reflects uh, the benefits of herd immunity. There's a new vaccine out uh, with more pneumococcal coverage. It's PCV13. It covers more strains. I think it's, it became standard in 2010. So now, um, with, uh, in a fully immunized uh, child uh, who's over the age of three months, who comes into your ER with a temperature of 103, who looks otherwise well and has no other focal signs of uh, an infection, 
um, the, the likelihood of a bacteremia is 1%. Um, so that's a, that's a phenomenal change. So now managing a well-appearing child over the age of three months who has had at least two conjugate vaccination at two and four months no longer needs a CBC or blood cultures. Uh, the testing should be reserved for infants who are sick um, uh, or who have received uh, less than two doses of their uh, PCV. So generally, the summary for eight weeks to 12-month-old, uh, well-appearing uh, infant with a fever of 1 or 2.5 or greater who is making good eye contact, has a social smile, is otherwise looks well, and does not have a fever, uh, does not have a cause for the fever on the examination. Um, the key point here is that you don't need blood cultures anymore for these patients. Chest x-ray only if clinically indicated, as I described above. And um, UA and urine culture for all boys who are less than six months. And if they're uncircumcised, as long as they're less than one year old, they should get a UA and a urine culture. And all girls under two years should get a UA and UC, a urine culture. And that's a very significant change in um, approach to fever. Just a couple of nursing notes. One of the most important things you need to remember is that a child um, who has a fever may not um, be very active, but there's a difference between somebody looking sick versus the fever getting them down. So you want to treat that fever early on, so by the time a physician gets to them, they, have, they see a child without a fever and they can make an appropriate clinical assessment. Very often mothers will come in and say, my child vomited one time and had a fever. That does not automatically imply that the child is dehydrated. A sudden increase in body temperature can all, uh, frequently cause vomiting in children. Um, and uh, with just one episode, they, that does not automatically make them sicker than everybody else uh, and does not mean they need IV hydration. You, all it means is just control their fever. And once again, fever education is always the most important part of this. Um, to, trying to take people's fever phobia away is the key to successful treatment.